Excellent. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this afternoon. We have a wonderful guest with us today, one who is going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration. And that is none other than our brother, student minister Otis Muhammad out of Brunswick, Georgia. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam, brother Joshua. It's good to be on the People's Podcast. Yes, sir. The honor is ours. Uh, before we get live, I mean, before we um, read all of the comments that people are showing love already from across the country, we always ask our guests the first uh, question that we have for you is, when did you hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Well, the, the, the first experience was um, a long, long time ago, uh, November of 1984. I was a college student at Morehouse. And um, one of my schoolmates told us that Minister Louis Farrakhan was coming to town and he felt that we should go hear him. Well, I had heard the name Louis Farrakhan before and um, I heard it and read it in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And they were explaining the problem that Louis Farrakhan was creating with Reverend Jesse Jackson's campaign. And um, I was a bit naive back then. I believe that Jesse Jackson had a chance of being president of the United States. Mm. And, um, and so I wanted to go see who is this man and, and why would he create such a problem when we're trying to have the first black man to become president of the United States? Well, we went to the church. I believe the church was called a chapel of love, something like that. And um, of course, when I walked in, I saw the FOI and they were so focused and so serious. You know, I'm thinking, man, where did these guys come from? And so, I, you know, we go in and we sit down and um, the program starts and then Minister Farrakhan comes out and starts to talk. He starts teaching and I'm sitting in that chair, I'm stunned. And I'm thinking, oh, we're at the wrong place. I was supposed to come see a guy who was a little on the crazy side and he's, has a, he's a problem and blah, blah, blah. This man is teaching truth I'm feeling enlightened, I'm feeling electrified, I'm feeling inspired, and I loved what I was listening to. Mm. I, I never took my eyes off of him the entire time. And I was so, so stunned that the program ended, Minister Farrakhan was gone, people filed out of the church, and I was still sitting in my seat. I couldn't believe what I heard. And it made me question everything because I understood, you know, they said one thing in Atlanta Journal and Constitution, they made him sound like a crazy man. But this man is not crazy. If, if anything, the rest of us are crazy. This man mm -hmm. is on, he's on point. And I, I, we, we walked out um, and got in the car and I'm really thinking, I'm thinking, you know, cause back then I believe they told the truth in the newspaper. And after that, man, we were riding back and I'm thinking, man, if the, if the newspaper will lie, then what about books? Mm -hmm. what, wait a minute, did they lie to me when I was in school about what's really going on in the world? And somewhere about halfway back to campus, the driver, Charles Carpenter, he said, well, guys, what do y'all think? And I had a lot on my mind, but I, I couldn't bring the words to express what I was thinking. I was, I was stunned, I was, I was moved, I was inspired. Um, I, I wanted to say, hey, hey, Minister Farrakhan, come back, I need to ask you some questions. But it was, it was a beautiful, it was, it was beautiful on one end and exciting on one end, but um, you hear the minister talking about transition. And so I started moving away from what I understood, what I thought I understood and exploring what actually is. And so when I got back to campus, man, I just, I mean, I went to class, but I wasn't there. You know, I spent my time um, going back over the things that Minister Farrakhan said. And um, I didn't join the nation right then. Um, I just, 
I couldn't, uh, I couldn't imagine myself at that time leaving the church. And so I just kept going to school. And, uh, but what he said inspired us because I was there, but my, my first cousin, Alan Booker, who's now commissioner Booker, he was with me in that church. Mm -hmm. And we ended up making a decision. Uh, I'll never forget Minister Farrakhan said, black students go to college and get education and information to come out and continue to build the empire of our enemy. Mm. And when he said that, I said, oh man, he's talking about me. Mm. And so we started planning to, to, to do something about Brunswick, Georgia. And right there at Morehouse College, we created the first organization in a list of many that we would, and it was called Youth Initiative Project. And um, the decision to come home and we're gonna grab the young folk, we're gonna, we're gonna flip it over, we're gonna you know, make everything right for young black folks in Brunswick. And uh, we actually got it, got it funded, got grants and everything. And uh, when I came home, that was my occupation. I was executive director of Youth Initiative Project. We had an office and everything. And we started building programs and trying to figure out the best way to guide young black folks in Brunswick away from you know, the dangers of life and get them prepared for life. So that was the first time um, I heard that. And then, you know, I just started continuing to work and build organizations and um, test the waters here in Brunswick to find out, you know, what's the social fabric like among black folks who are active in Brunswick, which there wasn't a whole lot. But that's what we that's what we did. And uh, by the grace of God, it took me eight years from the night I heard Minister Farrakhan to finally end up um, coming into the nation of Islam. Yes, sir. Beautiful thing. So, uh, yes, sir. Okay, Reverend Minister. I'm learning so much. 1984, go ahead. Yes, sir. And people showing you love all across the country. Sister Miriam says, I'm like my family. Um, Brother Daryl, I can't pronounce his name. O'Neill says, Grand Rising, guys. Grand Rising, Malik and Salam. And thank you all who are watching. Okay, so I always wanted to ask you uh, this, sir, as someone who watched me and my siblings grow up, and our family, what made someone who gets the teachings stay in Brunswick, Georgia? Like, like what is it about Brunswick that made you stay there and not like want to go to another city? What, what is it about Brunswick that made you want to establish Islam there? Well, um, it's, it's, it's a calling. Um, and, and I've had people make comments, a couple of guys. Uh, one brother who was in the first res, and uh, he told me one day, he said, Brother Otis, you are a lot stronger and braver man than me. What are you talking about? He said, there's no way I'd be in Brunswick, Georgia, standing on the corner talking about I'm with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad representing the nation of Islam. I never understood their fear. You know, why in the world would I follow a God that can't protect me? Why? That's a waste of time. If I have to be scared, then I, I need to leave that alone and go do something else. And so I never felt afraid. I never felt afraid. And, and uh, when the second man approached me and he, he was so-called processing in here in Brunswick and then he left. And um, he came back later and told me, you're a lot stronger man than me. But I, I, I grew up in the church with parents, you know, in the Baptist church who, they made us go to Sunday school and, you know, an 11 o'clock service and, oh God, the 6 p.m. service. Uh, but I always heard that, you know, when you, if you trust God, God got you. And so I did, I had no fear. Um, and, and trust me, there have been some things that have happened here in Brunswick that let me know there's some, there's some people who are paying attention and, and they're, they're not our friends. They're not our friends. They've let me know that we're watching, but I, I, don't, I don't see a reason. I, I believe that a lot of the person, the Master Father Muhammad can protect and guide me. He's done that for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's doing that right now for the honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan. Why should I fear? Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, sir. Excellent, yes, sir. Okay, um, and people are showing you love all across the country and bear witness and thank you for every like, share and subscription. Okay, now, um, 
Brother Otis, what I, my next question is, how did your family and friends feel about you accepting the teaching? <laughs> oh, boy, that's the story there. Because you, you got you to gotta get the picture. So here I am in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, attending a church since I was a little baby. And I'm always, I'm active, I'm involved. And we arrive at a point where we're having these youth services and I'm not the speaker per se, but there's a point in there where I go and um, we bring all the young people up and we drop a particular message on them. So it started getting me some attention. You know, I'm a Sunday school teacher and I'm, I'm breaking down the scriptures in class and everything. And so um, they were under the impression that I was going to be an up and coming pastor of the church. Mm. But um, as all of this was going on, I was also studying, I was being uh, guided. And there came a point in time where Allah disturbed every facet of my life, every single facet of my life. And when those things happen, it gets your attention. I had begun to, to study, I would come home, to my little apartment and read the Bible every single day until I read it from Genesis to Revelations. When I got to the end of Revelation, I turned around, started back at Genesis and read it a second time through, all the way through. Well, by the time I got to the end of the second one, I said to myself, talking to God, something is wrong here. Something is wrong. The understanding I'm getting from reading your word is not matching up with what we're doing. So I'm a little confused here. And that night, I kneeled in my living room and prayed one of the most sincere prayers I have ever prayed. And I asked God to give me truth. I have to have truth. I don't care where it comes from. I need to know the truth. And after that prayer, I went on about my business and not knowing what I had set in motion. And what I set in motion was my ultimate destiny is where I was, I believe I was born to be and to go anyway. And so um, things started happening at church, um, confusion, disruptions. And I began to have these very, very unusual experiences. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share one, one with you. I know sometimes that when, you know, you share this kind of stuff, it looks, on the spooky side, but this really happened. I was um, president of the Young Adult Choir. And um, so this particular Sunday, I was sitting in the choir and it was time for us to do a song. We did a song and I sat down and I started having these uneasy feelings. And it continued throughout the service and somewhere during the service, it felt as though someone was calling me out, beckoning me to come out of the church. And I'm sitting in the choir stand saying to myself, what is this, what's going on? I didn't understand it. And, and in fact, was a bit, a bit frightened. This is happening while the church service is going on. And so I went to, I got up out of the choir and went to the kitchen. And I stayed in there and I just prayed for understanding. Well, eventually it stopped and nothing else ever happened. Later on, um, around September of, I'm not sure of the year right now, our church was having a revival. And the pastor who was running the revival at the beginning beckoned us to fast with him. I had never fasted a day in my life. I had never fasted. You know, I was I was among those who enjoyed a good hefty plate. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. <laughs> so um, but I joined the fast. I never fasted before, and I fasted for four days. And during that time, I'm going to church, I'm studying scripture, I'm praying and asking him for guidance. And uh, at the end of that fast, I said, well, I, I still don't have an answer. And uh, the disturbances continued. Um, at that time, I was in my first marriage, disturbances there. 
uh, the organization that we created, disturbances there, the um, the church there, disturbances there. I don't care what angle, there were multiple disturbances, and I continued to try to figure out what was going on. But at some point during that fast, and um, a very, very kind woman said to me one day, based on the conversations that we have, I think you'd be interested in reading this. And what she handed me was a, an edition of the Final Call newspaper. Mm. <laughs> mm. And so I was at work, I stuck it in my bag. And when I got home, I sat down and I started reading it. And I, I found so much peace all of a sudden. Reading that Final Call, um, I felt a calm come over me that I hadn't experienced for, for weeks because I was completely disturbed. And at some point, I'm, you know, I'm at the end of the back of the final call, you know, I'm reading the part, what the Muslims want, what the Muslims believe. And I'm looking, I'm like, okay, I'm out of stuff to read. I flip it to the front. You know that section that talks about who's publishing it and it's got the address. And I read all of that stuff too, because mm -hmm. it was bringing me peace. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back to work, I asked that woman, could you, do you have any more of those? And um, sure enough, she did. And so I started reading the Final Call newspaper. I kept seeing reference to a very, very famous book called Message to the Black Man. And so I'm saying, man, they keep talking about this book. I got to get it. And sure enough, I got my hands on Message to the Black Man. And um, man, and the journey really began then. Uh, my, my family did not like that. Mm. I never felt so pushed out and ostracized. I never had that experience in my life, but this was very uh, scary to them because it, this is what we've done all our life. We've attended the Baptist church and I appeared to be coming, um, easing up into leadership. And now, here you are running over there with Farrakhan. And um, so based on what we understood, I even had a family member to tell my mother I was going to hell for what I'm doing. You know, but it was because they didn't understand. And they thought by me coming to the nation, I was turning my back on God. Well, by the time I processed in and Next thing you know, I'm on the corners in Brunswick, Georgia with Final Call newspaper and to see a childhood friend pull up to the light, see me there and refuse to turn his head and look at me. Mm. You know, those are, the, those are the things that you experience when you come in, but it's just a little trial. Uh, but by Allah's grace and mercy as a following Minister Farrakhan and, and becoming more equipped with the knowledge um, I began to go and talk to people and don't mention Islam. Don't mention the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Don't mention uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Just give them the knowledge and the understanding. And as I began to do that, I could see me winning. I could see me bringing them over. And uh, my mother, who was so afraid of this, at some point through that process, she said to me in her living room one day, she said, you know, you've grown so much. Why don't you come back to your church and teach one Sunday? Mm, mm. Victory. Mm. Said I won by Allah's grace and mercy. She invited me to come back to the church and teach one Sunday. And I did that. I did that. And um, after that Sunday was over, I believe all of my friends and relatives back at that church were convinced that um, I have not left God, that um, I couldn't grow as I've grown and then and have walked away from God. So that's um, that's some of the struggle in the beginning there. Um, this community, this was strange again to the community, even though during the, the days of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there was an actual mosque here in Brunswick. Mm, OK, OK. It was an actual, and that building is still sitting there right now. It's being used by a church, owned by a church. But um, that, it was built with the dome and the star and crescent on top. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, it wasn't recognized as a mosque because um, I think administratively everything wasn't being sent up like it needed to be. So they they would know that it's time to 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 get a number. Um, but you know the community really wasn't ready for the return of that. And um, so I had the unfortunate experience of a friend coming to me and telling me that Brother Otis, there are some people who meet regularly, Black people, and they're meeting to discuss what to do next to stop you. I thought, stop me? Black people want to stop me? Yeah, they want to stop you from doing what you're doing. And that's what the whole meeting is about. And I thought, my God, how do you, why don't they just come talk to me? Why don't we just sit down and talk about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and let me introduce them to the teachings? But no, that's what they were doing. So that's, uh, that's some of my, my, my beginning. Of course, there are tons more stories. That, but if, if I told them all, we'd be here until tomorrow this time. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. And thank you. Uh, and um, and everyone who's watching. And uh, Minnesota, so this on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, we thank Allah for your sacrifices and the many sacrifices of your family as well, sir, yes. to help establish Islam here in North America, but specifically in Brunswick, Georgia. Yes, sir. On some sacred soil down there. So we thank Allah for you and your family. Uh, recently, uh, I want to say like what three it had to be two to three years with the um, the murder of the brother that was on the news mm. uh, from the people who were hunted, you know, letting us know that racism is still alive and well in Brunswick, Georgia. And I saw on Facebook where you went with some of the FOI and you all were making your presence felt down there. Yes, sir. Uh, what is it? What does it feel like for you to like to still see this going on in you know twenty twenty? One, I believe it took place in 2022. Well, Josh, um, that that was that was um, some kind of experience. I, when I learned what had happened, um, and as the information was coming out, I heard that there was a video, and um, I was trying to get it because I wanted to see if we had enough evidence to convict. What I wasn't prepared for was what it felt like to witness a black man taken down like that. And I remember I was, I was going to my car in the backyard and I saw that I had the video, I played it. And the rage that took over me, I couldn't stop shaking and I had difficulty breathing. And I couldn't imagine the family, what it's like for them to know that all he was doing was jogging and someone believed they had the right to take his life from him. It was terrible. There was a lot of anger around here. There were a lot of conversations about what to do. Um, and I'm glad that those ideas and thoughts weren't followed through. It could have gotten even crazier. But on the backside of it, I saw some things that were so beautiful, I couldn't believe it. This was very organized. And some of you know, or you may know by now, um, a young man by the name of Akeem Baker who was Ahmaud Arbery's best friend. And Akeem is a, um, he's my cousin. And um, he's a rap artist now, but it goes by 912 King. Um, but, you know, he organized some things. They started having these meetings. An attorney got involved. Facebook page was set up. And each day, we got instructions on what we could do to help the case. And so there were emails. We need to send emails to this person here. Here's the email address. Here's what you need to say. And I know during that time, when I got up, one of the first things I did was to check my phone for my assignment. And everybody was, was cooperating. We were sending, following the instructions step by step. 
just as the attorney was was advising and guiding. And this was a this operation was so it was so unified. It was so together. And I remember at some point thinking about legal fees and what was what it was going to take. And apparently, uh, Akeem set up a GoFundMe with the idea that if we could just raise a hundred thousand dollars then that'd be enough money to take care of all the legal fees. But when it was all said and done, we didn't get $100,000. We got $1.9 million. $1.9 million to help Ms. Wanda make sure that those perpetrators were, um, were, were sentenced and, and put in prison like they needed to be. And so this, there was a lot of, lot of activity going on. If you, you remember, um, Devante was down here and CJ was down here and yes, um, uh, there was a rally there at the at the courthouse during the earlier days and we went there and we we spoke there and kind of um, kind of kind of set the crowd on fire a little bit you know because we, we really wanted to make sure we took care of all ends and at that moment the the DA Jackie Johnson who was guilty of so many violations, this was actually her third huge mess up. And so at that time, we were uh, signing petitions and um, to support a candidate to run against her and get him, get her out of that seat. And by law's grace and mercy, we were successful. She ran and she lost. And, um, and now she's, um, she has yet to stand trial, but she's going to. So that's, um, that's the kind of kind of thing that was going on uh, during that period of time. And, and of course, we're happy with the outcome. We're very happy with the outcome. Um, but we still lost our brother in a, such a terrible way. And um, I, I saw pictures of Ahmaud Arbery and my cousin when they were three and four years old. Mm -hmm. they, they've been together that long. And, uh, and it ends like this with a, such an unjustified murder. So by law's grace and mercy, this community was um, more unified than I've ever seen. I've never seen black people work together so well during that, when that went on, everybody, everybody's mind was like, you know, no, they're not gonna escape. They're not gonna escape. We wanna make sure that they go to prison for a very, very long time. And so I'm, I'm uh, Happy with that outcome. Of course, we uh, still have sorrow in our hearts for his loss. Um, there's a park now named after him. Um, and of course, the street, Albany Street, which is where my, me and my wife's bookstore sits. Um, it's an honorary Ahmaud Arbery Street. And so I'm happy to be have a business on that street. Well, praise due to Allah. Yes, sir. Go ahead, my man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Naima says, I praise due to Allah. She also says, Let's make a family. Welcome, Salam. Thank you, everyone who's watching all over the country. Um, continue to show love. Shout out to our YouTube family, Brother Musa, Kente, Sadanta, and everyone else who watches on all platforms all across the world. Um, what was the, the verdict? Well, they were found. Guilty, I, I honestly have forgotten the charges that they were found guilty on. Um, and they're both going uh, in prison right now. Um, they attempted to get it moved. Um, they were trying to get to a federal prison instead of the state prison, mm -hmm. uh, but they, it didn't work. And um, so they're, they're incarcerated right now. And, um, and I would imagine given what they did and um, going to a state prison in Georgia, I'd imagine that's a that's a pretty worrisome experience for them. Yes, sir. Well, all praises due to Allah. All yes, sir. due to Allah. I'm, I'm pleased that they are in the state prison. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir. Okay. Now I wanted to ask with um, with you, the May Man March, what was the climate like leading up to the May Man March and how did it personally impact you? Oh, that was a big one. We had, um, when we went to work, 
trying to inspire people to, uh, to go with us. Um, we were preparing to have a bus. Um, we passed out information, we talked to people. We walked the streets with our newspaper and a flyer about the Million Men March. And, um, and the, the primary reaction I got was fear. Mm. Afraid that, you know, if we got together black men in a crowd that big, they did not believe that white people could resist that opportunity. This is what I was being told. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we kept working. We found a handful of brothers who said they weren't, they weren't worried about that, um, that we were going. We don't care what happens. If we, if we die on this trip, we, we died standing, standing up for ourselves and, and standing with the minister. And I, when it was all said and done, we, um, we ended up counting myself with just 22 brothers on our bus. Mm -hmm. However, there was another bus. And um, I think um, probably right at 30, 30 brothers. So there were two buses that came out of Brunswick, Georgia. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. All praise is due to Allah. Uh, wonderful experience going up. Um, just hitting the highway and looking over to your left and seeing a, another bus and you watching, you can look over there and say, oh, it's a, another bus full of black men, you know, and just to, to ride and look over there and see another brother looking at you and never seen each other in our lives, but we know where we're going. So we throw up the black power sign, you know, looking at each other as we ride. So it, it, that experience was beautiful. Uh, the brothers were so excited. Um, the advice was given to everybody, listen, it's gonna be a long day. We should stop talking and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. That lasted about 15 minutes. And we got back into the conversation about what's going on, what we think is gonna happen, um, why we're in this, this predicament that we're in. And uh, I think we were among the earlier buses to arrive in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And of course, the second we got there, the press was there. And they immediately came over to our bus and um, wanted to ask me a couple of questions. And uh, to my surprise, the brothers, these, these weren't Nation of Islam brothers, but they immediately pointed and said, that's our leader right there and pointed to me. Okay, go ahead, my minister. <laughs> and so they came straight to me and I answered a few of their questions and about where we were from and what we hope to, to get out of this experience, but to be there um, and because we got there so early, you know, we were near the front. And so when the call to prayer was, uh, that was, that was uh, one experience there in the, the early dawn in, in DC, hearing that call to prayer and, and then the electrical experience of locking hands with brothers in such a large group, it was beautiful. It really, really was. Um, and as the sun came up to watch, look around and see the sea of black men, um, and then to make the journey to the bathroom and there's a wall and there are brothers who are a uh, man in the wall, helping the brother up this side and down that side. And um, it, it was, there was, there's nothing. I don't think there's nothing I'll ever see in my lifetime to match that, just the, the, the energy of it, the beauty of it, the number of brothers greeting each other, the way we were greeting each other, the absolute joy and happiness, you know, in that experience, it was, uh, it was just a, exceptional. It really, really was. And uh, to come back, come back home, you know, it was on a Monday. And so of course we had to not go to work but we made it back in Tuesday morning. I was going to work on St. Simon's Island. And I saw a brother walking. So I just came for the Million Man March. You know, I gotta pick him up. And so I picked him up and uh, he was walking kind of fast and we got in there and I asked him, where was he going? He told me where he worked. And I said, okay, I'll drop you there. And um, he said, man, hopefully I still got a job. Mm. I said, still got a job, man. What you mean, brother? You did something? 
No, I, I, I ain't do nothing wrong. I just didn't come to work yesterday. I said, what happened? You got sick or something? No, man. I went to the Million Man March. <laughs> and so I looked at him and I said, that's where I was yesterday. So, you know, we had to dap it up and, uh, and, and talk again about how, what an amazing experience it was and how excited it was to be there. And, and you know, there's that, that bond there because we both made a sacrifice to do something in the interest of black people, the black men in the black community. And um, I dropped him off to work and uh, gave him that black power sign, brother, hang in there, brother. They ain't gonna fire you. God is with us. And so I went on to work um, and everybody knew where I was. And so I, I got a lot of strange looks, uh, brothers who I asked to come with us and didn't come were asking, but when's the next one? I wanna go to the next one. <laughs> Yeah, so that that experience was beautiful, and uh, I have a cousin in Savannah who called me, and she said, she said I was on the way to work, and I had to stop and get something to eat. I walked into Burger King, and the line was so long, mm -hmm. but some black men up front looked and saw me back there and said, "Sis, come on up front." Mm -hmm. She said they all moved to the side, and she said when I was walking up there, I said, "I know that's the effect of the Million Man March." I said, that's right, cuz that's what it was. Praise be to Allah. Yeah, so beautiful things, beautiful things happened. You know, of course, there was the hard work of, of getting there. And um, my daughter got sick a couple of days before we were supposed to leave. We had to go to the hospital in Jacksonville. I barely made it back in time enough to uh to get on the bus and, and go. But beautiful experience and, and many things that I'm, I'll never forget about the Million Man March, and I still to this day, talk to people about that. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Excellent. And, and you're getting so much love from all across the country. Uh, Sister Queen says, Allah, walk by. Sister Rita Allen says, all praises to Allah. And thank you all who are watching and continue to show love. Now, I wanted to ask you about fear. Have you ever been faced with fear? And if so, how have you overcome that fear? Yeah. Um, you know, things happen down here in Brunswick. Um, and I, I believe, you know, it's an effort to really to punk us out, you know. And I gave an example. Um, I had a phone call and when I at the bookstore and I answered the call and the woman on the other end said that she was looking for Otis Muhammad, that this is he. And she told me who she was and that she had a message that she wanted me to listen to from Senator somebody. And she played the message. The Senator, whoever he was, said that, um, you know, George Bush is forming this economic development council. And because of my shrewd business skills, they were interested in me being a part of that council, and in fact, being chairman of that council. Mm. And, um, and if I agree, they will fly me into Washington DC for a um, black tie dinner with George W. Bush, and where he will autograph a, a picture for me. And, um, and they'll take care of all the expenses. And the recording ended. And the woman came back on and said, Mr. Muhammad, um, what should I tell the Senator? And I said, tell the Senator, I said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I hung up the phone. Now, what was interesting is at that time, I was still using my slave name on all mm -hmm. of my documents, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my driver's license, social security card, tax forms, everything. I was not using Muhammad, but they didn't call and ask for my slave name, they asked for Otis Muhammad. Mm. Secondly, I needed to, them to understand that I'm not stupid. You're really gonna fly me to Washington DC to see if, if, for me to be on the chairman of an economic development council. See, what that really is, is called sifting. It's sifting. So they're checking to see who is this guy. 
what is uh, what is he really about? Is he really, really with Farrakhan, or can we buy him off? Mm. And so that that experience happened. Um, I was a little uncomfortable with that because you know when you see something like that happen, you're thinking about your your family, and and what did you do about that? But you know we trust in Allah, and uh, He brought us right on through all of this. Um, there probably is another experience that happened before the Million Man March. And um, there was a, a Sunday where we had a conference call. We weren't, we weren't really doing all of the, the Zoom and web stuff yet back in 95. And the minister spoke and he, on that conference call, he brought the thunder. And I was sitting there listening and asking Allah to bless me because the next day I was going to the prison, I was a federal, federal correction institute in Jessup, Georgia. I was the religious volunteer. And so the next day when I left, it's 40 mile ride. I prayed for 40 miles, asking Allah to bless me to deliver this message the same way with the same spirit that your servant delivered it. And when I got to the prison, I went in and there was quite a crowd of inmates. Um, in that crowd was a brother who had been there the last two times I visited. And he asked the same question. The question he asked was on the day of the Million Man March, you know, y'all on the outside, y'all not going to work, y'all refusing to go to work. We men in here, what does Farrakhan want us to do in here? Mm. Now the alarms went off in my head as I'm looking at him and the brothers who subscribed to the nation inside there stood behind him and was trying to give me eye signals, but it wasn't necessary. I knew who he was. He was, mm. he mm. was trying to provoke me to say something. And the only response I gave him was the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has not given us any instructions for brothers inside the prisons. So there's nothing I can tell you. And so that day that I went, when I prayed for that kind of spirit to deliver that message, he asked the question for a third time. And I gave the same response. Now, my prayer was granted. I was blessed to bring a message about atonement that really shook the room. I've never seen so many black men stand up and cry in front of everybody and, and, and confess that at first opportunity, they were gonna call their mother and ask her forgiveness for the trouble, the stress and the worry they brought on her with, that, with the life that they lived. They just started naming people they were gonna call. When we said the closing prayer, I couldn't get out of the room for the number of brothers who just wanted to shake my hand and thank me. It took me 45 minutes to get on the other side of the door and the door was less than 30 yards away. Well, when I got out, I left and I went to, came back to Brunswick and I got a letter a couple of days later that said my religious volunteer privileges had been revoked. Mm. They'd been revoked. And they said, we found out that you have a cousin inside this prison, which I'm pretty sure they knew from the beginning. I'd been a religious volunteer for nearly a year at that point. And so I got, I got kicked out. A few weeks later, I got a letter, a phone call, from one of the brothers inside the, who were, was at the prison in Jessup. And he said, one night in the middle of the night, they gathered up all of the brothers inside the prison who subscribed to the nation's teaching and who were there that my last night there, didn't allow them to get their personal belongings, put them on a bus, drove them to one location and then disperse them all across the country. Now I'm thinking, okay, so that message was so heavy that, well, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't 
they couldn't, they stopped me from coming in. And the brothers who were there and were a part of it, they sent them to different parts of the country. They split them up. Now, I thought it was over from there, but it wasn't. One day, your father came to Brunswick and we were sitting around talking and catching up like we often do. And he, I told him what happened in Jessup. And when I was telling him, he turned and looked at me strangely. He said, so it was you. I, it was me what? What are you talking about, Brother Minister? Well, at that time, Brother Supreme, he said, I had a meeting with the Secret Service in DC leading up to the march. And I was having zero cooperation with them. They were giving me a hard time. When we had a break, a black secret service man came over to me and said, they're giving you a hard time because there's a man that says he's with y'all in Jessup, Georgia. He started a riot down there. Mm. <clears throat> so now let's put the pieces together. I didn't start a riot. The plan was to put me in a position where I did start one. And as a result of, of that riot, then you know the whole thing gets crashed or something. But that was their plan. That was their plan. Their plan was to put that brother, to ask me that question, and then I tell him that you all are men too. I don't care if you're inside or out on October 16th, don't you go to work. Tell that. I ain't gonna say it on this, this podcast. Yes, sir. Yeah. Tell that, tell them people that you are not going to work. And of course, then that's gonna start a big issue. But their plan did not work, but they carried it out anyway. So because they had that plan down here in Jessup, Georgia, it didn't work, they still carried it out and said that down here in Jessup, I, I caused a riot in the prison. That never happened. But that's what they told your father in DC. Hmm. So there I am, kicked out of the program, kicked out of prison. <laughs> I told my wife, you, you married to a bad man. He got kicked out of prison. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, but, you know, these things just show me, you know, we, we're, we're not a big group down here in Brunswick. We're not a big group. We're just a committed group. You know, and so when you got a committed FOI who has a committed MGT on his arm. Yes, sir. Okay, that's something there. That's something. And so, you know, we 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 do what we can down here. And um, there are still some people who are afraid, like the group who was organizing to stop me. Um, but we still alive, still God. Allah is still God, brother. And there's no way that we're going to stop doing what we do. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very important that we work as hard as we can to get the messages to as many people as possible. So we're going to keep doing that. Excellent. Yes, sir. And we, we have a few more questions for you, Brother Minister. Yes, sir. Brother no Mod is using the hand emojis to applaud Brother. Um, Adil Nasur says, very wise brother who knows all general orders are in effect. Uh, some like like Salam, Sister Queen says, all praises is due to a lot. Brother Otis answers Vanessa, absolutely. Sister Vanessa has been an aunt to me and my siblings, as well as, of course, my sister Otis being an uncle to, yes, to us since we were young, very young, before That's we right. watched us grow up. So may Allah bless you and your children. Yes, sir. Um, Sister Constance Muhammad says, That's right, and the exclamation marks. We can't wait to put this on YouTube. Okay, where can we, how can we support the bookstore? Is there a location or like how do, how do people who live in Brunswick pull up and people who aren't there, how can they uh, show love to you? Yes, sir. Well, the um, right now, uh, the bookstore, of course, is located at 1600 Albany Street. Mm -hmm. And um, we, are, we are doing, um, trying to get back to the things that we used to do. You know, the, the panic pandemic brought a whole lot of stuff to a grinding halt. And um, so what we we always busy doing back then was um, activities, you know, events. And so um, we just got started again back in um, uh, July, excuse me, June. We had the Black Music Celebration. Um, Sister Heck of a Mecca came down. Okay, and, okay. 
Oh yeah, she she was she was on top of her game. Oh my goodness. And so it was such a successful event because um, it was a black music celebration. We brought uh, we brought the Christians with the gospel music. And so we had gospel, we had some jazz, and we had we had rap, R and B. Beautiful, uh, beautiful. But it was a, it was a truly beautiful experience, and so um, it's so beautiful that we're doing it again it's in Excellent. September, September twenty third. We're doing it. We, we're doing it again. They'll come down here. So. Um, right now, if you are not in Brunswick, Georgia, um, the best thing we can do, we don't have our website up and running, um, but uh, we, have, we do have a Facebook page. You can drop us some, uh, uh, drop us a line there and we'll do everything we can to accommodate you. Absolutely. All right. And thank you. Um, some people are showing love in the comments. People saying that's right. You bear witness. And here we go. And then a sister said, Brother Benjamin, Shabazz P says, we have heard of you. You are a legend and a role model. So people are showing love and we oh. continue to show love to our brother, our student minister, Otis Mahana out of Brunswick, Georgia. We have a quick 60 second commercial break for all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast. And we're coming right back to our brother, our student minister, Otis, um, out of Brunswick, who deserves so much love and, and, uh, and respect for the work that he has done, doing, and will continue to do and show up. One moment. Hey, camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book, and now Spanish book. All three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 disinfected cleaning services out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in a Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. Excellent. And we have exclusively for you, Black Man by Sister Helen, the Black Man's Sacred Book a poem, a book of poetry and spoken word pieces. If you would like this amazing book, H-R-S-P-A-T-R-O-L 42 at gmail.com. And we have, we're doing, they're doing a special tribute. Sister Belinda, the widow of uh, student minister Batine Muhammad, who was a phenomenal musician, born second. We want to make sure that we uh, pay homage to him and the work that the great uh, music, music uh, the great artist that he was they're doing one in make georgia one second and we want to make sure that we show love up to um please here we go one second here we go there we go boom Aiken, Georgia, is a city rich in musical history. From the soulful sounds of Otis Redding III to the funkadelic grooves of Batin, this town has produced some true legends. On August 6 at 6 p.m., we gather at the historic Douglas Theater to pay tribute to these greats of Macon. It will be a special night as the all-star band takes the stage. Joining forces, the band will perform songs that were dear to Batin, Jamal Thomas, Otis Redding III, and Tony Bone Dorsey. Tonight, they come together to create pure musical magic. The guitar effortlessly weaving melodic solos that touch your soul. The heartbeat of the rhythm section driving the groove with infectious energy. The all-star band carries on the legacy, echoing with the same raw passion that captivated audiences decades ago. Together, these extraordinary musicians pay homage to Macon's music legends, honoring the legacies that helped put this city on the musical map. This night at the historic Douglas Theater, we celebrate the spirit of Macon and the indelible mark. 
these greats have left on the world of music. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime performance. Get your tickets now and join us for an unforgettable Perfect. night. All right, we're coming right back to our brother, uh, Student Minister Otis. And thank you all the people who are showing love in the comments. Also, Asiatic Minds Online School. Teach them to young kings and queens all across the country. Make sure you sign up. We look forward to Sister Sherry Muhammad coming on and explaining what new adventures they have upcoming in the upcoming semester. All right, back to you, sir. I wanted to ask you, you spoke about music. What type of music do you listen to? Oh, um, I'm really, um, I'm an R&B and jazz guy. I mean, current jazz, but also um, old school, you know, Coltrane and Charlie Bird Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, all of those guys. Um, there are some, there's a little bit of gospel I like too. And um, I think I've, I've heard one or two uh, that would fit in the country category that, you know, I, I'd listen to as well, but really, you know, R&B and, and, and jazz is my primary um, area there. All praises to you, Yes, sir. And we spoke earlier about Sister Vanessa. What advice would you give to uh, future husbands? Well, um, firstly, be sure that you build your connection with Allah first. That's the guidance, you know. Um, and you gotta you just to, to put it put it plain. You gotta get your game tight because I assure you, a well trained sister um, is going to test you. You're going to have to as a as a man, you know. I, I teach my my two sons that the difference between a male and a man is one word, responsibility. And when you are able to be responsible, you know, to your, yourself, your God, your family, your community, then you, you're, you're a man at that point. And the woman that you have on your arm can really respect you. That's what's, that's what's so, so, so important. You know, uh, the minister talked about, um, these, this, this marriage thing, and it's that the idea of union. Um, nothing, there's nothing in the universe that comes together without friction. And that's necessary because whatever the two things are, those the molecular structure has to be broken down in order for them to join. Yes, sir. So please do not expect that you're going to get married and everything is going to be a okay all the time. <clears throat> There has to be some friction to break you down from what you are and to break her down from what she is so that the two can be melded into one. That's the, uh, the, most, the most important thing. So before you ever in a courtship, before you ever approach a sister, be sure that you're able to be responsible first. And uh, if you got that part down, the rest of it between you and Allah will be a piece of cake. Beautiful, yes sir, excellent. Brother Otis, Brother Harrison says, uh, it's an honor to assist my beautiful brother who has served faithfully in the ministry here for 30 years. Um, Sister Jelana say, E says, all praise to Allah for you and your family. Brother Otis, can't wait for the next concert and Black Wall Street event. Allah walk by. Shout out to Brunswick, Georgia. Shout out to Al Tama, Honey Got Roll. Shout out to all of the, it only looked like a few landmarks in Brunswick. Shout out to the Walmart and to the... Uh, the pier, shout out to Jekyll Island, shout out to St. Simon Island, um, Sea Island, and all of the great memories that I've had yeah. visiting uh, Brunswick, Georgia in the summer. And Fennec um, Road. Great time memories in Brunswick, Georgia. <laughs> yes, shout sir. Out. And I was going to ask you, sir, you, um, you got to know my grandparents on my paternal grandparents. So you got to know my, or you've met my grandfather and my grandmother. You knew my grandma Evelyn and Papa, like our grandfather Ephraim. Did you meet yeah. them? Correct, you met them, correct? I, I, I met your grandfather mm. and had maybe two conversations with him, but I hung out with your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's, you talk about a, wonder, a wonderful woman and a, 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 lot of, a lot of fun to hang around. And um, I'll always remember, um, she 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 came with us to a funeral, my wife's mother's funeral. Mm. And um, after the reception, 
after the funeral, you know, we had the, um, um, what is it called? The repast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I was, I was sitting with, with grandmother Evelyn and I, I stepped away from the table and I saw some cake, you know, and so I, it looked really good. So I got me a nice piece and I came and I sat down next to her and, um, and she looked at my cake. And so she was looking at the cake and then cutting her eyes at me and frowning. And I, <laughs> she said, I said, oh, this cake is good. She said, and you didn't bring one piece to me. And I said, I must be an evil person, right? She said, you sure are evil. <laughs> so <laughs> we had we had moments like that that um, you know, it was a, a whole lot of lot of fun. And um, you know, it was it was, you know, life life is what it is. But you know, it was a sad moment, you know, when she left us. But she was a wonderful person to be around and always in a um, a good, good, positive attitude. She ain't take no stuff, and she's quickly, quickly <laughs> let you know. <laughs> well, beautiful Praise spirit, beautiful spirit. Praise be to her. Yes, sir. Thank you for always looking out for my family. Yes, sir. Um, since his name was laughing, and everyone is showing love. Uh, <laughs> please let your children know that we are family, and we are as one call away. And uh, your wife know, let her know we respect and honor her as well as we do yes, you. Uh, what would you like your old, uh, your um, legacy to be, Minister Odin? Um, as, as, as impossible as it almost seems to some people, I like for it to be known that there's, there's actually, um, a mosque in Brunswick, Georgia, a well-established mosque that, uh, that I had a hand in making mm -hmm. happen. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, for everyone to understand that, you, you know, we come here for a purpose. And I uh, know we, you know, we got to do the regular stuff of life. We got to go get jobs and all that stuff. But, you know, that job is not why you were brought here. You were brought here to do a particular work. And so that's what we should be focused on. The world is in the crisis that it's in because we're out of focus. We're so out of focus. And um, so I'd like it to be known that I was a brother who carried on the legacy of my father, who was, who was known to push and move the church forward. Yes, sir. And so that's the legacy I would like to, I'd like to, for that to be my legacy right there. All praise so a Yes, sir. And what are your parents' names? Uh, Otis and Vera Griffin. Okay, great. Yes, sir. So are you a, a junior or a third? Um, well, well, actually, they never put the junior on there. They, his, okay. he just had Otis, Otis Griffin, and uh, then they stuck David in the middle of my name and didn't put the junior on there, so... Um, okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, once again, sir, on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, we thank a lot for you and your okay. sacrifices for always holding it down and being an ambassador for the most ominous little Farrakhan and the spirit of him and represented in Brunswick, Georgia. And the reason I keep saying Brunswick, Georgia is because if you all go, it's such a lovely place, a beautiful spirit, and beautiful people that are there. So it takes, uh, a strong representative to be there to represent the people because you, you know what I'm saying it's just I enjoy our summers there yes, sir. and growing up and I enjoy visiting now when it's not for a funeral or you know mm -hmm. just something sad but when it's just to go to, to vacation there's nothing like Brunswick Georgia and the people yes, sir. in yes, Brunswick sir. Georgia so may Allah continue to bless you for representing and I know that he will and your children are all brilliant smart mm -hmm. we love them and um it's just an honor that you came on the people's podcast but I wanted to ask you one more thing. You said mm -hmm. that you, a co-worker of yours watches the People's Podcast in Brunswick, Georgia. So can you let us know about that? Yes, sir. Well, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he's, he's watching now. Um, this is, this is my, my brother, Mark Urban. He, mm -hmm. um, we have a special uh, connection uh, as, a, as a Muslim, but also we, uh, we came into the longshoreman work together. And... Um, uh, if you know anything about it, getting your foot in the door and getting through that is a challenge. It's a real challenge. And um, but Brother Mark and I, we walk through it together. And he's a very, very loving brother, um, willing to to help and 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 stretch out and try to do things to help someone other than himself. And so that's a beautiful thing about him. Um, when I told him I was going to be on, he 
he made sure he was, you know, I'll be on there and called his son way down in Miami to make sure that he's on his own as well. Uh, because they just, they just support like that. And, and just, a just a beautiful brother. And I uh, thank Allah for him being such a help, um, walking through that difficult period of time there. But, um, uh, but I also, Josh, would like to say that this is a very important thing that you do. Right. This is very, very important. Um, we, can, we can study all of the books of the nation, but the sooner what happened, what we were doing, I, I, I listened to, um, oh, I keep wanting to call him Jack, but his holy name is- uh, Wally. Wally, yes. Brother Captain Wally, um, that was a very special episode for me personally. You know, just listening to the flavor back then. You know, sometimes you, when you're trying to move forward, you say, well, what's, what's wrong? Why can't we go forward? You need to go back and listen to ones that did it. You yes, know? Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And, uh, you know, of course, one of those folks that I, li I listened to that did it is, is your father. You know, I get to hear a lot of, of, of how he did what he did. And uh, so it's really inspiring. And just for you to have this show that collects all that information and we get to go back and pull up old ones and check them out and see what was said back then. That's very important, I believe, for all, for all of us as believers. And I, I thank you for the job that you're doing. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. And for everyone who is watching, if you have guest suggestions, please reach out to me on social media, put them in the comments, message me. And we're looking right now to do some interviews of anyone knows, anyone who's in the uh, education field that deals with scholarships, loans, and or, and or grants. Please let us know. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off on the People's Podcast. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Thank you all for watching.